Hello, all of my history-loving friends. Welcome to the world of Madame Morbid. This is a history channel. I am your guide on any number of historical adventures. Today, we are going to be talking about the embalming, the funerals, and the grave sites of Bonnie and Clyde. And this will probably finish out this rash of Bonnie and Clyde videos. At some point, I will be doing more. There are sites I still haven't been to. If you are really into Bonnie and Clyde, you know that the law finally caught up with them on May 23rd, 1934, on a lonely, dusty Louisiana highway. They were blown to bits. I think it was pretty traumatizing for everyone involved. I have read that Bonnie's screams haunted some members of the posse for the rest of their lives. Clyde was killed instantly. He was hit in the head immediately, and it is said that Bonnie started to scream when she realized that Clyde was dead. And that's one reason she was shot far more than he was. And they were mostly shooting through Clyde to get to her. They kept shooting until she stopped screaming. They were shooting from the driver's side, so a lot of the bullets went through Clyde, into Bonnie, through Bonnie, and then through the door on her side. She was also shot in the head. She was hit in the mouth, which broke several of her teeth. She'd been shot multiple times in the back, one of which had severed her spine. Both of them were hit in the hand. Bonnie's was far more destroyed than Clyde's. You can find a picture of her hand on the Texas Hideout website. I am not sharing it because it is quite disturbing. When they were shot, Clyde was in his stockinged feet because his missing toes made it to where he couldn't drive in shoes because he could not feel enough to adequately put the pressure needed to drive. He was wearing sunglasses. He had on a blue denim shirt with a white pattern with a jacket over the top of it. He's wearing a fedora. Clyde had a pocket knife in his pocket. Bonnie also had on a hat. She was wearing a red dress. She had a half a sandwich in her hand. She had a pack of camel cigarettes in her lap. She was wearing an acorn brooch. She had on a delicate wristwatch. Her dress was red and expensive. Still, despite the color, you can see the blood stains everywhere in the photographs. I don't know what happened to that dress. Clyde's shirt survived and is in the museum with the car in Las Vegas. Inside the car, they found 1,500 rounds of ammunition and a virtual arsenal of weaponry. Neither had a chance to fire back, but there was a gun at the feet of both of them. There was also a guitar in the car. The coroner report indicates Bonnie was shot about 26 times and Clyde about 16. But some people think that each one were shot up to 50 times apiece. Given that Bonnie was also peppered with buckshot, if you counted each and every one of those, I think it could easily get to 50. Bonnie and Clyde were both given a cursory embalming in Louisiana so that their bodies could be transported back to Dallas. I'm now going to read you the text of a letter written by one of Bonnie's embalmers in Texas, and he really describes the condition of her body. Here is the text of the letter, which it's crazy to me that they don't know who wrote this, especially since I'm pretty sure we have the author on film. I mean, he says they do. He says he was a movie star. So he appears in the film of Bonnie's funeral. And I think he's the guy who walks around and lays the flowers on the grave. Why nobody can figure out what his name was, I don't know. The letter was written to Alice Shepard. Have they looked at her relatives? I... In any event, this letter was written by one of the people who prepared her body. Here's a first-hand account of Bonnie and Clyde as we had Bonnie. She was about the size of Rose Grace, weighing about a hundred pounds. A thousand pounds of dynamite, though. She was very pretty, of course. Her skin was somewhat tan. Her nails were beautiful. Likewise, her toenails. Her toes looked like fingers. The cuticles pushed back. The nails filed to a point. And a deep coral shade polish are there. 
the most beautiful toes I ever saw. Just perfect. Her permanent was just a month old. We had it waved. Her face, right side, was blown off. We fixed this, and you could hardly tell it. Just one bullet went through her brain, however, and a number grazed her head as there were three big holes in her scalp, but not through her skull. Her left eye was terribly black. However, I used eyeshadow on the other eye to match, so that was covered up. Now, her body was just mutilated and torn to pieces from shots. Her right hand nearly blown off, known as her trigger hand. Her body, besides being full of bullet holes, was full of buckshot, pellets all over her body. We received the body ten minutes to nine. Joe and I sewed on her until three that afternoon. At that time, they say 25,000 people were lined up outside. It took two hours picking dirt, rocks, etc. from her hair, then to wash it and have it waved. She had a tattoo on her right leg, two hearts, one red Ray, the other Bonnie. Ray, you know, was her husband, Ray Thornton, now in the pen. All the fluid the undertaker in Arcadia, Louisiana used leaked out. She was torn up, so she was a mass of blood, caked and dried. Took several hours in bathing her, had to scrape some of it off, and used gold dust to remove most of it. She had skin slip that morning, began to smell the next morning, turning dark, smelling worse. The last day was rotten, so to speak. The odor was awful. Her mother, though, sat in the room alone with her head over the casket. How she stood it, Lord knows. The other children couldn't. Her mother fainted 2.30 that night. I asked if she wouldn't like to go home. She went. By then, the entire house smelled. We had to keep her so Sister Billy that was in jail in Fort Worth could get out and come to the funeral. She was buried in an all-steel metal casket. Paper said $1,000, but that's wrong. It was about 600 maybe less. Paper said $1,000 for a vault. Wrong. There was no vault. She was buried in an ice blue negligee. She was dressed in expensive clothes when she was killed. About 40,000 people came to view her. Paper said $1,500 damage is done to the funeral home. Eh, it was more like 250 The woman next door, though, turned her hose on them to keep her flowers from being walked on. We had 38 officers stationed all over the house, the front and back yards keeping the crowd in order, and all of us as well. Four operators on the four phones. They rang every minute for two days and nights. We had a rubber mat about a half inch thick all over the funeral home. Officers were stationed to keep people on it so as not to wear the rug out. I'm a big movie star. My picture was shown in the movies. The paper stretched their stories. She was not to become a mother, as stated. She was diseased slightly, though, as stated. Now you have it firsthand, as I worked on her. Joe's and my work was praised very highly in every other line in the papers, and if I do say it, it was good. And she looked swell, no trace of disfigures showing. Clyde was cared for in another funeral home. Since both were such a challenge, I'm sure part of that may have been that's the way Emma wanted it. Part of it also may have been that it was easier than having one funeral home deal with two very hard cases. I don't know why the families made separate arrangements. We don't have a letter like that about Clyde, but I think we have to assume that the Dallas funeral home that worked on him probably faced a similar situation. This is the Bellow Mansion. This was a mortuary. And after Clyde was killed, his body was laid out here and 20,000 people went by his casket to look at his body. His funeral was held here on May 25th, 1934. Emma did not attend Clyde's funeral. I don't know that any member of the Parker family went to Clyde's funeral. Bonnie's funeral was the following day and Clyde's parents did attend her funeral. It was pretty well known that Emma blamed Clyde for her daughter's death. 
and she just could not bring herself to attend. I am here inside the Texas Rangers Hall of Fame in Waco, Texas. Two retired Texas Rangers were put in charge of taking down Bonnie and Clyde. So they have a display case here with a lot of things from Bonnie and Clyde that were found in the death car. Also artifacts just from throughout their career. This is Clyde's watch. It says on the back of it, it says Clyde B, which we can't see the back of it. Kind of wish they had a picture. This Smith & Wesson Model 10 revolver is possibly the weapon that Bonnie snuck to him in McLennan County Jail when he escaped. These broken handcuffs belong to Sheriff George T. Corey. Corey and another officer were kidnapped by Bonnie and Clyde on June 10th, 1933, near Wellington, Texas. This was right after the crash where Bonnie got burned so severely. They were hiding out in a farmhouse. That family got suspicious, was able to notify the police. When the police came to the house, they took them prisoner. They handcuffed them to a tree. And later it was necessary for the lawmen to break the handcuffs to get free. Uh, these two guns were used in the ambush. This Colt Monitor machine gun was used by Ted Hinton. It's like the civilian version of the BAR. This Remington M8 semi-automatic was used by Manny Galt. They have a few things here that belong to Raymond Hamilton. This Winchester Model 1910 was a weapon he used. These glasses are actually ones he used when he was trying to disguise himself. This Winchester Model 1901 pump action shotgun was found in the death car. It's believed to have been Clyde's. This Remington Model 11 is believed to have been Bonnie's. I have no idea how they would know that unless it was at her feet. I kind of assumed most of the weapons were found in the back seat, but if it was at her feet when she died, then that makes sense. I just don't have that information. Clyde was buried in Western Heights Cemetery. And at first, Bonnie was buried two miles away in Fish Trap Cemetery. But she was suffering a lot of vandalism, and in 1945, they moved her to Crown Hill Memorial Park, where she is now, shortly after her mother died. So I don't know if those two are connected or not. Let's go see their graves. If you're coming out here to visit Clyde, when you come in the entrance, Follow the brick road. Well, I'm here at Clyde's grave. His stone says, gone but not forgotten, and oh boy, is that true. He's buried right next to Buck. Kimi and Henry are right next to them, and then older brother Elvin is also here. Marvin, or Buck, always blamed himself for Clyde getting into trouble the way he did, and there may be some truth to that, but Clyde made his own decisions. It's just really unfortunate that Buck chose to go to Joplin with him because he wanted to try to convince him to go straight, and then uh, it just went so wrong in Joplin. And then Buck got sucked right back into it and was on the run with them, and then he got killed. There is an empty spot right here that the descendants of the Barrow family and the Parker family want to put Bonnie right here. Emma absolutely would not allow her daughter to be buried by Clyde, who in her estimation got her daughter killed. Bonnie made her choice. Bonnie knew she would die and Bonnie died for Clyde. She died to be with Clyde and she belongs by Clyde. Now that is my personal opinion. And you know, her mother's wishes were honored, but her mother's gone now. And you know, Bonnie even wrote in her poem, they'll bury them side by side, Bonnie and Clyde. I, they belong by each other and it's clearly what Bonnie wanted. So Clyde has been left 
a bottle of Heineken. He's got a little shot of Jaeger. And he's been left a money clip. Now, Clyde did drink, but not a lot and not in big, not often and not in great quantities. He, he was a teetotaler and he mostly did it because he wanted to keep his head and be able to get away if something bad happened and that uh, served him well many times. But he's got a very nice headstone. Uh, he and Buck have a nice headstone. Bonnie's behind that hedge right there to help you orient yourself if you want to come by here. Just right at the, the front of that hedge where it begins. I'm here at Bonnie's grave. She's buried here next to her mother and she obviously is visited much more than Clyde. She's got all kinds of stuff left here. So many flowers, there's a toy gun. There are liquor bottles and she liked, she liked liquor a whole lot more than Clyde did. There's a tube of lipstick. She wore all kinds of makeup. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to. She was a chain smoker. Hair clips. There's a little saxophone that should have been left on Clyde's grave. Actually, there's two things of lipstick. There's a little toy car. Actually, it kind of looks like a spaceship. It's a strawberry Rita drink, some sort of margarita. She, there's a hair tie. This is very Egyptian. <laughs> looks like her mother died 10 years after she did. And it's because of her mother that she isn't buried by Clyde. But you know, she loved her mother too and if she ever needed to see her mother and she asked to come home to visit her mother, Clyde never turned her down for that. And sometimes she just really needed to see her mom. The flowers are all made sweeter by the sunshine and the dew. So this old world is made brighter by the lives of folks like you. I think she had the potential to make people's lives better, but that's not the path she chose. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving's coming up soon, so I, a lot of people are starting to decorate for Christmas, so they may deck out this hedge. There's absolutely no grass here because of how many people come and stand here and visit her. Uh, it's obvious that her grave is far more popular than Clyde's. But it's also in a little bit of a better neighborhood and it is easier to get to as well. You can pull your car into the cemetery, which you can't do at Clyde's. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope this episode didn't bum you out too much. And if you liked what you saw and stuck around to the end, please like this video. Please subscribe to my channel. I will see you next time.